An Outpouring of Love by Charles McCullough By wintertime, Chris and Bobby found themselves on a wearisome downhill slide. They were living on the hard side of town, and there was a strong sense of finality hanging in the musty air of their two-room broke-down palace. According to Chris's recounting, he and Bobby were unwitting victims of a series of ill-fated circumstances that befell their storybook world. Subsequently, and consequentially, an extended stretch of unemployment bestowed upon them the luxury of unfettered time and freedom. Unfortunately, it also gave rise to a deficiency of pretty much everything else. On what would turn out to be one of their waning days together, Chris and Bobby whiled away gray December daylight hours, killing Miller lights and filling an ashtray with the spent remains of menthols. And they hoped for providence, or at least a little bit of luck, in the coming of halcyon days. Naturally, as afternoon gave way to dusk, communion gave way to lust. Fueled by an appreciable beer buzz and sparked by passion, Chris and Bobby surrendered to their desires and ignited. They capsized vinyl chairs and cast clanging empties to the worn linoleum floor and made epic love on the kitchenette counter. The wanton winds of their tempestuous congress swept them across the room into the recliner and then onto the futon where their mad tryst reached its climactic destination. In the aftermath, they drifted into an uncharted, sheltered harbor. Outside, a steady snow covered their sorry surroundings, like a thick coat of latex mopped over bad wood. Through fogged windows and the fuzziness of the day's beers, Bobby said it was the most beautiful sight she'd seen in all of her 18 years. As night fell, Chris was overcome by the events of the day, He rose out of the futon, took a deep drag from a menthol, and drained the last swallows of a miller. Then he slipped a coat over his sinewy bare torso, opened the back door, and woozily waded into the ivory wonderland. Chris unzipped his jeans, and in body temperature calligraphy, he inscribed Bobby's name in the snow. Then he adorned the touching dedication with a heart pierced by an arrow and he used his last drops to dot the eye with a tiny angel that had gossamer wings and a halo of stars. His tender expression of love made Bobby's lower lip quiver and stirred quiet, sweet tears. In the long run, Chris's public declaration of his love for Bobby was prophetic of the destiny of their ephemeral affair. What had once been warm and arguably beautiful eventually turned cold and became a vague stain on the pristine white landscape. Dubious life choices were plainly at the heart of Chris and Bobby's plight, and more than anything else they were victims of their own design. Even so, I couldn't help but believe that the fated lover's story deserved a more hopeful epilogue. As time passed, I found myself unable to shake the feeling that some deeper drift was concealed in the young lover's tale of heartbreak and woe. I felt that there were sublime signifiers surrounding me, but I was unable to dial them in. They faded in and out of my mind like whispered radio signals from some primal antenna out on the perimeter. It was on a late February afternoon when the crackling emanations returned, only this time they were more distinct. So I went out for a walk, hoping to tune into the transmission, or barring that, escape its range. Squinting into the blinding long rays of the winter sun, I drifted into the slushy current of the city sidewalk, and I watched as the gutter channeled the course of the filthy frigid snowmelt into the sewer where it drained from sight. It was at that moment that the henceforth elusive intimation made itself present. 
The snow that had once served as stationary for what promised to be an everlasting love letter had thawed and was now flowing toward the sea. From there it will rise up into warm spring clouds, and soon enough a healing shower will bathe us all.